Today, we're going to continue our series on the history of medieval science by covering the rebirth of European intellectual activity known as the 12th century renaissance. I'm calling history and in this video we will cover the growth and establishment of the medieval urban schools, the medieval translation movement as well as the rise of the medieval universities. Stay tuned! While the Carolingian Renaissance had seen a reinvigoration of scientific and philosophical activity in Western Europe since the fall of Rome, it had mainly involved the recovery and preservation of what little philosophical and scientific writing that still existed in Europe. And when Ptolemy's empire fell, no longer than a generation after his death, this intellectual activity was halted as Europe re-entered into nearly two more centuries of political turmoil. However, by the turn of the 11th century, this turmoil would come to cease as the emergence of strong monarchies that were able to reduce internal disorder and secure their borders against outside enemies led to the creation of a lasting political stability in Europe. This political stability was followed by a growth of commerce which taken together with technological innovations in agriculture during the early middle ages such as the water wheel and the free field crop rotation system created a huge increase in food supply. As a result, Europe's population growth exploded to double or even triple between year 1000 and 1200 AD. These improvements created drastic changes in the European landscape, with the increase in urbanization being one of the most important changes for the development of medieval science. It's widely agreed among scholars that there exists a close relationship between education and urbanization, which can be seen in the educational invigoration that followed the reurbanization of Europe in the 11th and 12th centuries. Most education in the 11th century was offered by urban schools that was starting to spring up in Europe's growing cities. These schools were either cathedral schools, schools run by a local parish priest, or general public schools without any clear connection to a religious institution. The emphasis of the teaching programs in these schools could vary considerably depending on the vision and speciality of the teacher who directed it. In these schools, some teachers managed to make a name for themselves among intellectual circles, and in some cases where a teacher didn't think that these ambitions could be sustained within a local school, the teacher might decide to make the school migratory rather than geographically fixed. And there are examples in the high middle ages of classes traveling between cities held together by following the itinerary of a charismatic teacher. The rise of the urban schools in the high middle ages marked two new characteristics in the European intellectual history during the Middle Ages. First, they generally marked a rationalistic turn to attempt to apply the intellect and reason to all areas of the human enterprise and the curriculum, including the Bible and theology, which can be seen in the creation of the ontological argument by Anselm of Canterbury and Peter Abelard's using of philosophy to solve theological questions, both of which I will cover in more detail later in the series. Secondly, the rise of the urban schools witnessed a determined effort to recover, as well as master the Latin classics, surpassing anything seen in the early Middle Ages. By the 11th century, the scholars in Western Europe were no longer content with preserving already existing writings, but set out to assimilate more of the to them unknown classical writings, which currently resided in Byzantium and the Islamic world. While the West and the East never had been fully separated, the intellectual exchange during the early Middle Ages had been meager, but that would soon be about to change. Christian Europe would for centuries had been on the receiving end of aggression by Islamic conquests and pagan raids, had become strong enough to turn around and go on the offensive, which can be seen in the Crusades and the Reconquista. The Reconquista in particular led to the acquisition of rich libraries in Iberia, where ancient Greek and Arabic works were stored and ready to be translated into Latin and transferred to Europe. This movement of translating Greek and Arabic sources into Latin accelerated the influx of ancient philosophy into Europe, 
and by the end of the 12th century, the major portions of the Greek and Arabic philosophical and scientific literature had been recovered, which dramatically affected the course of the intellectual discussion in Europe from mainly having been dominated by the works of Plato and the Church Fathers to become more and more centered around the writings of Aristotle. However, the translation movement did not only coincide with changes in discussions regarding science and philosophy, but it also changes in where these discussions were held. By the turn of the 12th century, the typical urban school was small, often constituting of a single teacher, and perhaps 10 to 20 students. Just a hundred years later, these schools had grown dramatically, both in numbers and size. During the 11th and 12th centuries, the increase in education at elementary level had led to the demands of higher studies among ambitious intellectuals, and certain cities such as Bologna, Paris and Oxford had acquired a reputation for advanced studies in either the liberal arts, medicine, theology or law, which turned them into attraction centers for both teachers and students. With the numerical expansion of both teachers and students, many recognized a need for organization to secure rights and legal protection, especially since most of them were foreigners, and thus without the rights of the local citizenry. In order to do so, groups of teachers scattered together into associations, very similar to guilds, and referred to themselves as universities a term with originally no scholarly or educational connotations, only referring to an association of people pursuing common ends. Among the aims of these associations were self-government and gaining monopoly on the teaching enterprise in their local area. By the virtue of high-level patronage from popes and kings, who offered them several privileges and benefits, the universities gradually managed to secure a varying degree of freedom from outside interference and thus the right to establish their own standards and procedures, as well as gain protection, tax exemptions and immunity from local jurisdiction. Needless to say, with the universities well cared for and considered vital assets by both the church and secular rulers, who generally took the side of the university when it was in conflict with local powers. A typical medieval university was comparable in size to an American liberal arts college, having between 200 and 800 students, while the most famous ones like the University of Paris and Bologna may have had as many as 2 to 3,000 students. Students and teachers in the universities were generally considered to be of clerical status. This did not mean that they were to become priests or monks, but that they were under the authority and protection of the church, and had certain ecclesiastical rights and privileges. The rise of the European universities is one of the most important events in the history of science. As the eminent scholar Edward Grant points out, the university is a completely medieval invention. Nothing like it had ever developed in any preceding or contemporary civilization, and because of the universities, the intellectual renaissance in science and philosophy in the 11th and 12th centuries not only arose, but it also became institutionalized and could thus continue well beyond the Middle Ages, instead of busting due to a lack of interest like it had in antiquity. Today, I hope you learned something new about medieval history and the history of medieval science. And don't forget that if you like this video and want to see more videos like it, hit the like, share and subscribe buttons.